It ought to be in those two places before it ever gets here. But aren't we privileged to be able to come together and share what's on our hearts? Things that maybe we had taken a little for granted. Our faith. Our families. And our fellowship. How precious it is. And I praise his name for it. Let's take our Bibles and turn to a passage of scripture you may have looked at recently. Luke chapter number 15, we're looking at phrases and words. We notice that the prodigal spent all. The only way to keep from spending all, and boy, it can be done, yeah. is to never forget all that has been invested in you, right. all that has been spent on your behalf. Yeah. And you won't throw it away. The great investments that have come our way. I thank him for all that he's invested in me. And I thank him for all the people that he has allowed to invest in me. Another word that we focused on is the word and. That conjunction, how things are plugged in, and all of us are the same. Right. We've got those plug-ins in our lives. But the greatest plug-ins are those divine conjunctions right. where the Lord uh, couples us up, yes. first of all, with his son. Yes. Ain't that amazing? 23,875 <laughs> ands brought Jesus to us. And it'll take heaven to find out how many ands it took to get us to Jesus. But I'm glad he's still landing us all the way to eternity. Thank God for those ands. But I want us to look tonight, if you will, in verse 17. And I want to pull the word enough out of the text and look at it. The word enough. Enough. Let's begin reading in verse 11. And we'll come down through verse number 23. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into the far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into his fields to feed swine. He would fain have filled his belly with the husks which the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread, and here's our word, enough, and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Son, but the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. 
I'm interested in verse 17, that word enough. As we can tell from this parable, the prodigal son has in mind that he's going to venture off into unknown territory. He's going to a far country. But little does he know that what the Lord is going to do, as we will notice, is he's going to put him on a spinning wheel. And I call it the spinning wheel of enough. He's going to spin him around, get him disoriented and a little bit confused, and finally bring him back to the place to where he realizes that his father is enough. Amen. Now this is true for the prodigal son, but it is true in all of our hearts. Yes. That God desires to keep us in that place to where we see him as our fullness and our satisfaction. And we understand that no matter where we're at, that he is all I need, and he is enough. Amen. And so I want you to take a little ride with me. I call it the spinning wheel of enough. The places that God takes us as his children, not necessarily just a prodigal son, but in all of our hearts we get those times and places to where uh, it's just not enough. And so what he wants to do is put us on that wheel and bring us to the place of refreshment and of rejoicing as we realize afresh and anew who the Father really is and what he means to us. So I'm just going to jump on the wheel. We'll go uh, four or five places and hopefully we can see ourselves in the past in these places, but analyze your heart. You may be in one of these places right now. The spinning wheel of enough. If you'll notice with me in verse number 12, when we pick up with the prodigal son, and I'll use this phrase throughout, we find out that nothing is good enough. Now verse 11 tells us that he has two sons, and we don't know where the story is going to go from there. We don't know what all transpired from verse 11 to verse 2. Because these are true to life stories. This, didn't, this is not just a story that Jesus gives or a parable for that day. It's a parable that happens. It's, it's, it's life. It happens in every family where there's someone who has come to that place of which nothing is good enough. They have gotten over the very precious blessings that have been given them. They've gotten over the love that has been bestowed upon them. Somehow as they look around to where they're at, it does not satisfy them anymore. Yeah. This boy, for some reason, and we don't know what reason, and it doesn't make any difference what the reason is. He has come to the place, a very dangerous place, to where he is dissatisfied, he is unthankful, and he is ungrateful. Now the danger of being in the place to where nothing's good enough anymore it simply means that somehow you're seeing beyond the relationship that you've got now. Somehow, maybe there's greener grass on the other side of the fence. You don't, you don't, you don't appreciate all, as I say, the things that has filled your life with so much joy and blessing up to this point. And so as a result of that, in his spirit of ingratitude, He's not really that far from the far country. As a matter of fact, the far country is not so much an avenue, but it's an attitude. It's not so much a country as it is a concept. It's more of a demeanor than it is a distance. The prodigal son is at home, but he's already gone. Do you realize tonight that to go Anywhere, from somewhere, you have to leave from where you're at. Right. And though we may be in the house of God tonight, and though I may be preaching from this pulpit tonight, and though you may have sung, and though we may have been here to fellowship, who knows where your heart is? Right. Who knows where my heart is? 
We must analyze and find out if God is still pleasing to us. And if not, we are not far from the far country. Because the far country will get into you long before you get into it. We find that this boy is at the best place that he could ever be. But he's thinking about the worst place that he could ever go. He's in a place of love. He's in a place of security. He's in a place of plenty. But yet he's already in the far country. It's gotten into his head. It's gotten into his heart. He gathers all together. It's even gotten in to his hands. He's just one desire. Can I say to you, children of God, we could be just one desire from the far country, one attitude from the far country. Where you're at is where you're at. Listen to this. No matter where you're at, and I mean by that, where you are in spirit is where you're really at. And let us, let us understand that is it, a, it is a very dangerous place to be. He has stepped on the spinning wheel when we find him because nothing is good enough. Breakfast is not good enough anymore. The bed I sleep in is hard anymore. I don't like dad telling me to do what to do anymore. I'm just not pleased. I'll tell you what I'm done with this life. Nothing is good enough. Oh, let us examine our hearts. Are we still thankful? Are we still appreciative for all that we have in the present tense? He thinks he's going to the far country, but he's stepping on the spinning wheel, this, this spinning wheel of enough. Nothing is good enough. But look back in verse number 12 again. The Bible tells us, he said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. The second, second position on this spinning wheel now, as God is moving him along as he does all of us, he has moved from nothing is good enough to now he can't get enough. Isn't that amazing? He comes to his father with a demand, with his hand out. And he's asking his father to give me. I notice when he returns, his attitude changes and he says to his father, I want you to make me. But it is here that he has this entitlement spirit. His father has provided for him so long. I mean, everything he's ever had has come through his father's care, but now he thinks that he's worth more than what he has gotten. Oh, how dangerous that is. The horse leech, as the proverb said, Solomon said, just says, give me, give me, give me. I tell you, America has been a blessed country and we've gained so much from it, but it, 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 it is so possible to be discontent with what you had and all you want is more. Amen. He's crying out. And did you know the one enemy of grace is entitlement? They can never come together. Entitlement of which you think you deserve can never abide with grace because grace is what is given to you when you don't deserve it. Amen. Our streets are being filled with these different sects and different groups and different uh, specialties of people that are holding their fists out and saying, you owe me this and I demand this. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The only thing that we deserve is hell itself. And the very breath that we have, how thankful we ought to be for a God that has led us awake today and enjoy this beautiful sunshine and to make it to the house of God and to be able to fellowship. I'm going to tell you, we are blessed so greatly. If he never ever does another thing for me, he's done more than enough. Oh, the hands are out. Everybody's so greedy, wanting more, not satisfied with even what we've got, but demanding that somehow we get more than what we have. But I did tell you he's on a spinning wheel then, didn't I? God has a way of working through that. He'll let you ride that spinning wheel. He'll let you step onto it where you're just dissatisfied with everything. You're angry at it. You don't even know why you're mad, but you are. You're done. 
fun with it. And then you'll move to that second place to where you can't get enough. You think this world owes you something special. But then if you look in verse number 13, and we're moving on this spinning wheel now, go with me. It's, it's sometime in life we all have to ride this. <laughs> Notice it. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into the far country. Now we began with nothing is good enough. And then he moves to he can't get enough. He's always searching for more. But in verse 13, we notice that now he's come to the place on this spinning wheel till he thinks that he is enough. For the first time, he's got it all together. He gathers all together. He's never been in that country. He doesn't know anything about that country. He doesn't know about famines. He doesn't know about starvation. He has no grip on where he's going. All he knows is, I'm getting away from the Father. I'm moving away from his word, his way, his will. I'm going to where I can live my life the way I want to live it. I don't need the controls and the authorities. I need to be able to pick my own friends and spend my own money. I want to be king for a day. I want no God. I want no rules. I want no instruction. I want to be out of reach and I want to be out of hearing. I don't want to be a part of anything that even reminds me of the familiarity of home. Amen. You ever notice how stupid people get when they come to that place where they think they're sufficient within themselves? Now that can happen at 16, but that can happen at 20, that can happen at 40. I've seen some people at 60 and even more. I had a preacher I was preaching for, he said, I had an odd thing happen here a week or so ago, preacher. I said, what was it? He said, I had a couple in my church, 80 years old, that tell, told me that they needed counseling. The man said, I, we need, me and my wife need counseling. He said, well, okay, but I wonder what I could tell them. So we set up a time, we went in, and we sat down, and he said, I said to them, well, okay, uh, what's the problem? He said, the man looked at me and said, she says she's going to leave me. He said, I looked at her and said, you're going to leave him? She said, yep. He said, why? She said, well, I'm 80 years old. I want to live it up for a while. <laughs> well, I don't know what kind of living up that she had in mind <laughs> at 80 years old. I said, you know, I'm 66, and what I like to do is find out where all the action is and stay away from it. <laughs> I don't know how you could do that at 80 years old. But here this boy is going into the far country. He thinks he's got the personality for it. He thinks he's got his pockets full and enough for it. He thinks he can handle everything that is thrown in his direction. But how ignorant. He is. How unwise a person is at this stage of their lives. I've seen people at 40 years old just fly off the handle and they're way gone and you talk to them it's like you're not talking to the same person. They have become, I remember speaking to a fellow one time and, and he was up in age and, and he said, Brother Ben, I want to tell you something. And, and, and it had been rumored some things were going on. And so I sat down. I didn't ask to talk to him. He wanted to talk to me. Time it was done, I realized he was guilty of everything he was trying to say he wasn't guilty of. I never told anybody else, but I told my wife. I said, something's wrong. I see, he said, why? I said, he's talking like he's 16 years old. Gone back in time. Bankrupt in the ignorance. This old boy somehow thinks, I mean, he starts out, nothing's good enough. He can't get enough, and now the poor deluded, deluded soul thinks he is enough. You know, as I was pondering that, I realized that, and I want you to understand this statement, and I think you know it to be true, that once someone gets into the far country, Humanly speaking, now you're hearing what I'm saying. 
humanly speaking, it is virtually impossible for them to get out. He doesn't realize he's walking into a place of darkness that he, within himself, will never be able to get out. You say, why? First of all, he's not going there to come back. It's not in his heart to ever return home. He does not go into that country with a map marking each turn in case he doesn't like it down there. He ain't going back to that place. He's got plenty of money, but he's not going into the far country setting up a bank account at the far country bank, FCB. Setting up two accounts. I'm going to set up one over here that I'm not going to touch in case I don't like it here. I don't have enough money to get back home. And then I'll put this one over here and I'm just going to spend this and have a big time. No, he puts it's all in one bag because he's planning on, as he does, spending it all on righteous living. He has no plans of coming back. Understand, you've met people like that. You know that, that you can't push them out. You can't, there's no need to even talk to this boy. You can't pull him out. I'm going to tell you, you can't pry him out. And I'm going to tell you, this is true, and I found this out as a parent. You can't pay him out. The more money you send into that, the more longer you're just going to keep him in there. You can't even preach him out. He won't listen to what you got to say. He's down there forever. Humanly speaking, he's not coming out because it's not in him to come out. And there's nothing about that world that's going to encourage him to come out. Matter of fact, there's nothing of that society that will ever even remind him of home. This world is not set up to influence us in a godly manner. They have ripped the Bible out of the school. They've tried to take prayer out of the school. Honey, there they ain't no God in politics. You can, you can tell that right away. I mean, it's all gone there. Education, science, uh, I mean, evolution, the whole world. They're wanting to drown out the sound of a far country and a heavenly father and forgiveness of sin and the possibility that you can get out of the mess that you're in. I'm going to tell you, even when he gets down, there's no hope of him find a psychiatrist or a psychologist that's going to sit him down and say, young man, I have I figured out what's wrong with you. you you got family problems. What's your, where's your daddy at? You need to go back and talk to dad. No mentioning, no sign. There are no road signs in that country. It says the father's house in that direction. Nothing about this country is even going to remind him of home. That's not what it's about. It's not in his heart and it's not in that. He ain't coming back. Do not waste for your loved ones to come home from the far country thinking that they in and of themselves is going to make that move or that someone down there is going to send them and that this world is not set up for that. So I say to you, you see what I'm saying? He's on that spinning wheel. He starts out, nothing's good enough. That's very dangerous. You ain't far from the far country when nothing's good enough. He can't get enough. The greed and the entitlement and then, God forbid, he thinks he is enough. But I got some good news right here. I notice in this parable of the far country that there's somebody in the far country who was also at the house. You say, well, who was that? God. God. You say, well, well, I didn't know God was in the far I didn't think God went into the far country. He had to. That's where he got me. That's where he finds all sinners is in the far country. You say, well, where can you find God in the far country? Did you read there that after he wasted it all, that there was a famine? Who controls the weather? I mean, not just a famine. There was a mighty famine. Good news, children. While you can't bring somebody down to the far country, you can't pull them out, you can't pry them out, you can't I push them out, you can't pay them out. Thank God you can pray them out because God is there doing what you and I can't do beyond our means. Hallelujah for the God. David said, 
If I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. There is nowhere God is not in me. Can't do. I'm glad he's out there in that far country working right now to bring somebody home. Amen. He's in the far country. Isn't it amazing how God can get into things and turn them around to where they say what they never had said before? How God moves, God moves in that far country. And what he does is he begins, I tell you now, now don't, don't let me get off this spinning wheel now. Nothing's good enough. He can't get enough. He thinks he is enough. And then God moves in and begins to make things bad enough. Amen. Oh, God has to get into the program and turn you upside down, inside out, and get you so confused you'll think you're a termite in a yo-yo. Your world begins to wear you out in the fall. Country. God's a moving. And while that world would not say anything, would not say anything about the Father's house or the, uh, the, the home country or about heaven or anything, that God gets in it and it starts talking to him. Look in verse number 17. The Bible said, and when he came to himself. And he, 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 when he comes to himself, he gets to talking about what he hadn't even thought about before. He said, well, I was, I was just thinking about my father's house. I was thinking about everything that was at the father's house. Now, what made him go to thinking about that? I take God working in the far country. You think about that famine now. That wind is blowing across that desert country. It's a whirling and a twirling and a swirling. And of course it always does. You know how the wind is when it blows around it. Ooh, it'll make that noise. You say, well, what was it doing to this boy? It was talking to him. Boom, boom. That wind was a telling him, boy, you better go home. There's a famine on down here. His stomach's a growling. He ain't never been hungry in his life. But he's hungry. And you know how your, your stomach will growl and groan, make the noise. And his stomach's growling and saying, It's a talking to him about It's what he said. He came. He said, man, I can't. Man, hold on here. My stomach, is it preaching home to me? Is that when preaching? And he goes, the Bible said that he must have went to his friends because no man gave into him. Now, he's, he's funded the whole thing while he's down there, but now he's broke. And he goes to them to try to find something to eat. I guarantee you, here's what they said to him. Boy, you ain't from around. We can't take our stuff here and get, we're, we don't even know where you're from. What's your last name? Where are you from? If I had any advice to give to you, what I would tell you is, you better find, you better go back home. Everything in that world told him one thing. You need to go back home. Hallelujah. Oh, the time when God's able to take the alcohol and the drugs and the situations of this world and get you so low. I mean, things, he, he starts out, nothing's good enough. He can't get enough. He thinks he is enough. And God begins to make things bad enough till he gets low enough. Here's my word. He's had enough. Verse number 17, he has a visitor. You say, I didn't know the prodigal son had a visitor. Well, he did. It said, and when he came to himself. The prodigal son visited the prodigal son. You see that? Now, I pretty well know what he said because listen to the text. He walked up to himself and he said, you know what? You stink. Look at your clothes. They got holes in them. Did you spend all that money daddy had? What in the world? If I was you, I'd tell God I'm sorry. I'd tell my daddy I was, I'd go back home right now. And the prodigal son sitting there in such condition looks up no doubt and says, I was thinking the same thing. He came to himself. Oh, and when he did it was because God had broken things down and God had got him to the place to where he was low enough to where he had had it. This is not a place of negotiation. 
This is not a place to where he thinks that he's going to go home and fool daddy and then return. This is a place to where he has been turned completely. And he has repented of the far country and he's going back to the Father's house. Ooh, what a blessing that is. That now he has come to the end of the road and he has had enough. You can tell by the way he's talking and by the way he's walking. He's had enough and he has come to this conclusion. He started out, nothing's good enough. I can't get enough. I think I am enough. God makes things bad enough till I get low enough. And now, thank God, I've had enough. Right. I often tell people, as you can tell when somebody's got, you can tell when your young man or your husband or your wife or whoever it is has gotten right with God, they'll come home doing the talking. Right. And there won't be excuses either. They'll come home telling you, what this old boy was. He, they, he turns, I mean, every sinner when he gets saved turns in, in a sense, to a preacher because he wants to tell people what God saved him from. Yeah. And here and now he, is, he has come to that place where he finds out that the Father, thank God, is enough. Yeah. He goes back to the house. Now, Nothing's changed at home. Right. There ain't nothing different there than what it was when he left. Right. Except for one thing. You know what it was? Him. Because now as he comes home, he sees things that he has seen but he never saw. Right. He's able to appreciate now the love of that father. He's able to appreciate that food, he's able to appreciate that love. I mean, to tell you, he's able now to understand how blessed the Father is. And for the first time in his life, God, the Father, has always been enough. But for the first time in his life, he realizes that the Father's house, the Father, is enough. And what God does in all of our lives is he likes to bring us to the place to where we realize that he is enough. Now, I was speaking to an elderly gentleman over in North Carolina, and he was telling me just off the cuff about, uh, in his area, the power, electricity, had been off for three days. And he said, you know, preacher, I never realized how much I had taken electricity for granted, being able to take a warm shower, the wife to cook on the stove, turn the heater on. I mean, you use it for everything. But he said, that power off three days. He said, I can't tell you how many times I felt like a fool just out of habit flipping that switch, and it wasn't there. And to realize that all the amenities that I was able to enjoy because of power meant nothing without the power. And he said, finally, they sent out word that in our area the power was coming on and they told at a certain time. I think he said at 3 o'clock or something like that. He said, I waited by the switch. He said, I just stood there. I could not wait. And he said, he said when, the, when the time came, he said, I flipped that switch and the lights came on. And he said, it was more than just turning lights on that time. It was an experience. But he said it was right then that I began to realize how much of God's plenty that I had taken for granted. And what has to happen is God has to put us on the spinning wheel to bring us back to the place to where we can rejoice in who he is and thank him for all he is and what he has done for us. And some of them said, well now preacher, what do you do after that? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You do what we find in this text. Once you've come back and you're full and you realize you've got a father and you realize that that father favors you and that that father loves you and that you've been forgiven, yes. there ain't but one thing left to do and that's party. I mean, rejoice. Did you notice that in the text? Let's go over to verse number 26. Notice this. 
The Father has said, let us make merry. In verse 20, matter of fact, he uses that word four times. Let us make merry. And notice what it said. The Bible said for this, verse 24, for this thy son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be what? Merry. Now the elder brother didn't like it because look at what it said in verse 25. Now his elder brother was in the field and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music. Now you Baptists hold your ears. And dancing. Now I... I've always been against dancing. So I looked that up in the Greek to make sure to see what that meant, music and dancing. You know what it means? Music and dancing. Huh? Somebody said, well, I'm again that. We'll talk to the Father. He's the one who set it up. This boy didn't set up his own party. The Father set it up. The Father's the one that had the fatted calf killed and said, we're going to make merry. And the elder brother come in there and he said, well, I don't like that kind of party. Well, it ain't your party. Right. I mean, he said, I would go to that church, but they say amen, they raise their hands and they sing and all that other stuff, but, I, but it ain't your party. Aren't you glad that you can rejoice in what God has done for you that in some senses has never been done for anybody else because it is a personal thing? And they're inside that place rejoicing, rejoicing and thanking, I'm telling you, thanking God that things are different. And can you imagine that boy when the first time he sits down to eat and he ain't had a meal in a while and he's so grateful now. He can't all eat choked up and he looks up and says, Daddy, I want to thank you for forgiving me. Can you see him when he lays in that bed at night and feels that uh, comfortable bed and he wants to tell the father in the middle of the morning, Father, I thank you for this. Amen. Now there's always a religious elder brother around right. that can't hardly stand somebody being thankful yes. and, happy. and happy in the Lord. And I imagine he would say, now, Father, I can't eat with him. Talk with you. And the father came back and said, oh, but he was dead, and now he is alive. Let him alone. We've come together to make merry. And you'll know, you'll know, listen to me, you'll know when you're at the right place on this spinning wheel because it's at that place when you will know that he is all you need no matter what you need. Somebody said, well, preacher, what are we supposed to do as the church in these last days? Well, there ain't one, one thing left to do. Rejoice. That ain't going to change my standing. I'm already seated in heavenly places. My sins are already forgiven. My name's written down in glory. They can't change. No matter. Hey, got good news for you. No matter what happens in Washington, they can't change a thing that God has done for you and done for me. So we might as well just keep on singing and dancing. Praising God for his goodness and his mercy. <laughs> I learned that one in West Virginia. <laughs> there are times when I will come to, into a service and I realize that it's a ministering time, that what the Holy Ghost is going to do, somebody's hurting out there. And, and you've noticed that in services where it's just a time of which it's just ministering to that heart or those hearts. And then I've noticed that you come to church and it's meal time. You, all you're going to do is get the word of God and you're going to eat and you're going to say thank the Lord for the word and, it, and it'll help you in strength. But don't you think every now and then he just says, you know what, let's just have a good time. Let's just go ahead and rejoice in the Lord. And this is where the prodigal son, but you can't do that when things are not good enough. I mean, you, you just think that nothing's good enough. You can't get enough. You think you are enough. Things get bad enough and low enough. And you've had enough. But honey, when you come back to the place to where you can say, thank you, Lord, then you can rejoice. Because that'll be enough. 
That'll be enough. And God has to do that for all of us in different ways at different times. Isn't that true? I heard about a little boy, and I'll close with this, a little girl that's at the county fair. And uh, they'd spent about all the money. They had enough money to ride the, uh, for one of them, to ride the merry-go-round or to get some cotton candy. The little girl wanted cotton candy. The little boy wanted to ride that merry-go-round. And he won out, so he got to ride the merry-go-round, and she waited on him to get off, and he got on. You know how the merry-go-round, they just go round and round, round 10, 12, 15 times, and then they just stop, and you get off where you get on. And she was waiting on him there, and uh, she's all boiled up and mad. She said, now look at there. You done went and spent all our money, and you still ain't went nowhere. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Lord has a way of getting us to where we need to be. And oh, what a blessed place to be tonight in the house of the Lord, to sing his songs, enjoy the fellowship of his people, feel his presence, and look around and see what all he has put into our lives and be grateful for it. The spinning wheel of enough. Let's stand. Our emphasis in the uh, prior services are the same as tonight. Somehow to bring our hearts to the place to where we can thank the Lord for all that he is doing for us. Praise him that he is enough. It could be tonight in this COVID time that the Lord would warm your heart. There'd be a freshness that would say, thank you, Lord, for my wife. Thank you, Lord, for my husband. I don't know where I'd be without them. Lord, I thank you that my children are as well as they are. Thank you, Lord, for the friends that you've given me, the work, the finances, the food. It's just unending. Lord, I just want to thank you most of all that you are enough. Could be we'd take a moment tonight, no further than our need, to thank God for all heaven has done and ask him to keep our hearts safe and secure. The will will never get on that first run of nothing being good enough, taking it all for granted. You listen as she sings and be obedient. As I struggle along, they say I have nothing Well, they're wrong about that. In my heart, I'm rejoicing, and how I wish they could see. I want to thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. How many ways has He blessed you? There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. And I've got food on my table. Oh, ain't you got it? Shoes on my Oh, yeah. Lord, you gave me your love and a fine family. Even this part of this song is not so for me. I don't have much money. 
I've had plenty to sustain me today. As far as I'll tell, I can tell I'll have enough for tomorrow. That's all that matters. Though the world may not see. So I just want to say thank you, Lord. For your blessings on me. Got a good place to sleep. To sleep. <laughs> There's food on oh, I'm not even worried about getting hungry. Ain't that good? And shoes on. Got some pretty good shoes on my feet. You gave oh, the greatest thing he ever gave me was his love. And a fine family. Oh, I oh. would feel I'm thinking that one of the things that God is doing with the church in this hour is he put us on that spinning wheel. We've taken him for granted. We've taken this for granted. It's hard not to. You get so used to it. But it looks like, and I'm not a gloom and doom preacher, and I'm not even sad about it, it looks like things may change pretty quick. Right. It looks like hell is going to roll across right. this world. Yes. That ain't just me saying it. Right. That's coming from every corner of those that's got any sense at all. Yes. She ain't looking good, but I've still got a good God. And I think he might want us to find out that he'll be enough when things don't seem good. Find out who he is in troubled times. Jesus said they hated me, they'll hate you. This world is mad. They're mad at God but they're going to take it out on the saints. That's the way they always were. But oh, what the Lord will do through everything is bring us to that place where we say, well, Lord, I didn't know you could do this through that. Right. In the ministry, we're in... Normally, 70 churches a year. Or some 53 meetings in our schedules. COVID hit and we've been out 15 weeks. Well, you know, somebody said, I would, I'm living on a fixed income. I said, I'd like to. <laughs> Preacher ain't preaching. I mean, my car blew up. 11,600 and some dollars. The day, the last day of the last meeting. Now this is to the glory of God. And all of that time, I never picked up my phone and called anybody and told them anything. And don't ask me how. But everything was taken care of. And the Holy Ghost said, now, son, don't you go preaching for money because what I'm showing you is I can take care of you when you ain't preaching. Right. Ain't that wonderful? Yes. Talking about a good God as we begin this service. Oh, his goodness is out in front of us. He's the shepherd. His goodness is behind us. Surely mercy and goodness shall follow. David said it followed him. Goodness is above us. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above. Goodness is in us. He said, I've begun a good work in you. I'll perform it. Goodness is beneath us. He said, God called the dry ground earth, and he saw that it was good. <laughs> Everything you are came out of the dirt. He's talking about that. That's good, ain't it? 
and his goodness all around us. And we know that all things work together for good. He just got to get us to the place to where our hearts will erupt in thankfulness for how good he is. And find out he is enough. You've got to get on that wheel. I have people who tell me, they say, Preacher, how can I get my child from drug addiction, alcohol addiction? They have to get a point on that wheel where they hate that far country. And they hate what that country has done to them. And there's only one way to look up, and that's look up. And uh, the wonderful thing about it is, is anyone who's ever got to that point in their life has always found a loving father ready to rescue them. Amen. 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 That's so wonderful.